Hold ye fast unto his statutes and commandments, and be not of those who, following their idle fancies and vain imaginings, have clung to the standards fixed by their own selves and cast behind their backs the standards laid down by God. Baha'u'llah. Through the protection and help of the blessed perfection, you must conduct and deport yourselves in such a manner that you may stand out among other souls distinguished by a brilliancy like unto the sun. If any one of you enters a city, he must become the center of attraction because of the sincerity, faithfulness, love, honesty, fidelity, trust, truthfulness, and loving kindness of his disposition and nature toward all the inhabitants of the world, that the people of the city may all cry out, this person is unquestionably a Baha'i, for his manners, his behavior, his conduct, his morals, his nature and his disposition are of the attributes of the Baha'is. Until you do attain to the station, you have not fulfilled the covenant and the testament of God. Abdul Baha. <clears throat> so this week, we're really happy to have Mr. Luis Enrique Boist, and he's going to be talking about how obedience to the universal laws is true liberty. Mr. Boist is accredited as a consultant in human and social development with the United Nations. He's given lectures and training in more than 30 countries in the three Americas, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, and holds master's degrees in social development and education, art and history of culture, and graduate certificates in development planning, University College London, and human development, UNESCO. Mr. Boyce is an architect slash urbanist, and he has a translator and interpreter diploma. He's worked with hundreds of educational and business organizations, both governmental and non-governmental. He's also developed a wide array of courses and published works. So with that, I'll hand it off to Mr. Boyce. Okay, hello everybody. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be with you. This afternoon here is still morning with you. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you really very much for helping me uh, choose this topic that is a very thorough and interesting aspect to analyze in, in terms of our lives, in terms of our conduct, in terms of social uh, development and behavior. And <clears throat> uh, yesterday I thought I was just going to, to talk to you about uh, some of the ideas related to the subject, but uh, during the night, I decided to add some images. <laughs> so I hope the images also help you in going through the ideas and, and the things that are related to liberty through obedience uh, to universal laws. Uh, let me then share with you the first uh, of the slides. And <clears throat> then we we can move to the ideas and then later uh, asking you to also share your thoughts and uh, ideas, reflections about this. Liberty <clears throat> uh, through obedience is not something very um, intuitive in, in general we have the idea that uh, obedience takes away from us liberty. Yeah? And especially when we refer to laws, we tend to uh, think that laws are something that uh, somehow restrain our liberty. And my purpose with this uh, short presentation is, is to try to to advance some thoughts on this uh, uh, intuitive notion and, and to present what somehow is a counterintuitive notion that freedom, especially, come through obedience to laws. <clears throat> okay, in the universe we live, it's nowadays quite clear that uh, we are immersed in universal laws, especially with the development of science through the last 200 years. Uh, science has 
come to discover and unveil <clears throat> a myriad of laws. <clears throat> and we now understand uh, a multitude of laws that wouldn't even be thought of a hundred years ago, even 50 years ago. <clears throat> so there are lots, laws that um, command the physical world from galaxies and, and planets and stars to the most minute forms, forms of life uh, on earth like bacteria and amoeba and and also <clears throat> these laws apply to our own bodies in terms of health and development. The laws apply to all the sciences. And it's fascinating how understanding the laws has brought humankind to a new level, a completely different level of development from a hundred years ago. If we, if we realize that a hundred years ago, we didn't have uh, electric light in our houses. So we didn't have appliances. The telephone had not been invented or not even the TV or whatever nowadays for us is common usage. So <clears throat> this universal laws, they regulate everything in which we live, both the physical world and the spiritual world. And that's what I would like to uh, investigate with you. The physical world is quite apparent, it's quite obvious. And the physical laws have been systematically discovered and unveiled by science during this last 200 years. But we now know also from investigation from the human sciences like psychology, anthropology, sociology, we know that there are also spiritual laws that also uh, regulate and command the spiritual nature of, ma of man. So in reality, we are immersed in a universe of laws, in a universe of universal laws. <clears throat> of course, physical laws act and are applied differently from spiritual laws, but they are all of both of them laws nonetheless. <laughs> So all universal laws, <clears throat> both, both physical and spiritual, they have three very important characteristics. They are invisible, they are immutable, and they are inescapable. All universal laws, both in the physical and the spiritual world, cannot be seen. They are absolutely invisible. They cannot be changed. They are unchangeable. They are immutable and we cannot fly away from them. <laughs> we cannot escape them in any way. So they are inescapable, invisible, immutable and inescapable. The physical laws are, are basically discovered, discovered by investigation, especially in science. Sometimes they are discovered by chance, many of the modern world inventions and, and discoveries were made by chance. Yeah? And spiritual laws, on the other hand, are basically revealed. And the main source of revelation are the religions of the world, the prophets of the world. In any way, uh, both physical and spiritual laws, because they are laws, <laughs> They ask from us obedience. They demand obedience. That is the nature of laws. They demand from us and from everything that is within their reach, obedience. Now, these universal laws, both physical and spiritual, they offer many, many advantages to our lives, to our physical lives and to our spiritual lives. They offer regularity, they offer stability, they offer predictability, they offer safety, and at the very end, they offer liberty. So if we analyze, for example, the GPS system that allow us to know where we are 
on the face of the world with a, a measure of centimeters and find our way all around town and, and, and country and, and continent without looking at maps anymore <clears throat> because we are being guided by satellites that circle around the world. All these satellites, all this trans transmission of data, all this marvel of modern technology could not be achieved or applied if there weren't laws, if there weren't physical laws that offer us regularity, stability, predictability, and safety to develop artifacts and, and, and tools that, that allow us to have the liberty of moving around, knowing where we are. <laughs> so laws, both physical and spiritual, they are very advantageous to all of us. <clears throat> now, let's analyze a little bit how we relate to these laws in terms of obedience. If we have a healthy cow pasturing along the, the beautiful cliffs of Dover, in, in England, um, everything is all right. And the pasture is there, it's green, the cow is happy, is, is eating what it needs and likes to eat. But if the cow by any chance uh, somehow <laughs> slips and off the, the edge of the cliff, if a cow slips off the edge of the cliff, we have just one consequence, and that is the cow falls. The, fo the cow falls probably to its death because the cliffs are uh, a couple or a dozen of yards high. Well, <clears throat> there are a, a series of laws that apply to a cow falling from a cliff. There is the gravity law, the great, one of the greatest laws of the universe. But there are also the laws of aer aerodynamics. Uh, a, cloud, a, a, a cow doesn't have an aerodynamics that allows, us, allow, allows it to fly. There are the laws of inertia, the air thrust laws, laws of friction, laws of wind currents, many different physical laws that do not allow the cow to fly. So the cow falls to its death. And this is dumb obedience. As you remember that the laws are invisible, immutable, and inescapable. So the cow obeys the laws, all the laws, but it is dumb obedience. So the cow can only feel the effect of the laws in a brunt manner. Now, if a man goes to the edge of a cliff and prepares himself to jump, he may fly. He may be wearing one of these flying suits or, or one of those different apparatus that allows a man to fly when he is not inside an airplane or a helicopter. And this is also obedience because the gravity law, the laws of aerodynamics, the laws of inertia, the air first laws, the laws of friction and the laws of wind currents, and all the other ones that apply, they did not disappear. <laughs> they are still there and acting invisibly, immutably, and inescapably upon the man. But he flies because this is intelligence, intelligent obedience. So we can <clears throat> relate to the universal laws in two basic manners. Being obedient in a dumb manner and be the, being obedient in an intelligent matter, manner. And, and that makes all the difference in what happens to us. So basically we have this 
freedom through obedience to physical laws means firstly knowledge of physical laws. When men started to try to fly, uh, they failed a lot because they, they discovered that there, there were many laws applied uh, to flying that they, they didn't know quite well and they didn't know how to relate to them quite well. They didn't know how to, to be obedient in a systematic and intelligent way to the laws. Yeah. During the 20th century, we, we made headways in terms of liberty through obedience. So the first thing is really knowledge of physical laws. The second one is obedience to these laws. No one is able to fly if he or she is disobedient to the law of gravity. No, the law of gravity must be obeyed completely, systematically, intelligently. And through this obedience and to all the dozens of other laws that apply to flying, a person is able to fly. So liberty does not come through disobedience, but through knowledge of the physical law and through obedience to the physical law. And this is the third stage, freedom through obedience to physical law. <clears throat> the same applies to spiritual laws. Freedom through obedience to spiritual laws is what we generally call happiness. Happiness, satisfaction, plenitude, fulfillment, both in our individual lives and in our relations, both in our familiar <clears throat> environment and in society at large, all good, all good things in the spiritual life of man come through obedience to spiritual laws. So the first thing is to, to know what are the spiritual laws and how do they function. The second is intelligent obedience to these spiritual laws and then happiness comes through obedience <clears throat> to these laws. There are many different uh, spiritual laws. We could refer to hundreds of them. <clears throat> but basically the first and most important, the foremost spiritual law is love. We are told in the Bible that God is love. That is what <clears throat> St. John teaches us in his fourth epistle. God is love and he who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Love is not just a feeling, just love is a power, love is a force, love is a law, and it's the law of attraction. Where there is love, there is attraction, commingement, joy together, and where there is no law, there is the opposite, separation, antagonism, hatred, persecution, and death. Another very important aspect of the spiritual laws, besides, besides all the virtues, <clears throat> during the decades, we have been working here with 73 virtues, 73 virtues that are basic laws for spiritual behavior like compassion, patience, perseverance, justice, truthfulness, trustworthiness. All these virtues are spiritual laws and obedience to them bring, brings freedom and happiness in different ways and in different aspects. But another very important spiritual law that is related to the law of love is what is called the golden rule. The golden rule is to do to others what we would like to have been done to ourselves and not do to others 
what we wouldn't have done to ourselves. I have put here in English, the golden rule in the, some of the world religions and traditions. Uh, I will not read all of them. I will later pass on the PDF of the presentation to Amir. And, and then you can uh, have it later on, but let's just see some of them. Uh, in Christianity, right in the middle of the image, you can read what Christ said, in everything do to others as you would have done to you, or, or as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. I've, I've taken the translation from <clears throat> uh, what is regarded as the best translation in English uh, of the Bible, the new revised uh, version, updated edition. There are many, of course, you know, dozens of translations of the Bible, uh, but the new revised version is the most trustworthy and academically uh, sound of them all. So this is from the new revised version. It's very interesting that in this, when, when presenting the law uh, of the golden rule, Christ also offers a tool to recognize the false from the true prophets. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, during the centuries, due to fear from false prophets, we have also rejected many true ones. And it is really a pity. Uh, it's, it's not only a pity, it, it's, a, it's a disaster for humankind in general. Of course, the Bible says that there would be false prophets, but Christ is emphatic that we can also distinguish, distinguish and that we must distinguish the false from the true ones. And the Bible offers three great guidelines to identify a true prophet, three great guidelines. First, Christ says that uh, by their fruits, we are going to recognize them. By their fruits, we're going to recognize the true from, from the false. And in Galatians, uh, St. Paul offers uh, a guideline of what is a fruit from a prophet. What are the fruits, the good fruits and the fruits of, of, of the body or the fruits of the flesh, as he calls them. So this is the first guideline. The second guideline is, is uh, when St. John advises to analyze every spirit and recognize if the spirit is from God or not. And he says that every spirit that confesses that Christ the Lord came in flesh is from God. And the one that does not confess that is not from God. So this is the second uh, tool that we may use. And we can analyze the words of Muhammad and the words of the Bab and the words of Baha'u'llah, all the prophets that came after Christ, of course. And they all recognize that Christ came in flesh. So the second uh, the second test is passed by them. And the third test to analyze and, and separate true from false prophets is this very word when Christ presents the golden rule. When he says in, every, in everything do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. You see, that's what he says. This is the law and the prophets. So the true prophets teach this, that you should treat others as you would like them to treat you. The false prophets teach the opposite. They say, kill them, even if you don't want them to kill you. Hate them, even if you don't want them to hate you. Mistreat them even if you don't want them to mistreat you. This is what the false prophets teach. But the true prophets say the opposite. They teach the golden rule. 
let's see in Hinduism, 5,000 years ago, how the prophet Krishna says in the great uh, teachings of the Hindu faith, don't do to others what you don't want done to you. And also wish for others what you wish and aspire for yourself. That is the whole law. He did well. 5,000 years ago. And it is as <laughs> actual and, 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 and modern as anything that we might say nowadays. Going through the ages, going through the centuries, going through the millennia, we go, for example, to the Yoruba tradition. That is the tradition that the black slaves brought from Africa to Brazil during the sixth century. Whenever someone breaks a branch in the forest, he should think how he would feel if he himself were the branch being broken. It's so beautiful. It's, it's the golden rule with an ecological touch. <laughs> and then we have, of course, from the writings of Baha'u'llah in the 19th century, if thine eyes be turned towards justice, choose thou for thy neighbor that which thou choosest for thyself. Blessed is he who preferreth his brother before himself. And it's very interesting that Baha'u'llah says this is out of justice, not out of mercy, not out of compassion. That is the essence of justice, to treat others as we would love them to treat us. So these are some aspects of, of the spiritual law. So <clears throat> as we saw, basically physical law is discovered by science and spiritual law is revealed by the infinite, unreachable, unknowable, universal God, the true and only God of all the universe, who reveals his word to the prophets. We know from all world religions that the prophets say that what they bring is not from them. It's not out of reflection. It's not out of thinking. They are not philosophers. They are tools. They are vehicles to the word of God. So God reveals his word to the prophets and they bring to us and they reveal to us spiritual laws. These are the laws that allow us to have happiness individually <laughs> and in our social lives. And whenever we disobey or we go against, or in reality, we uh, obey in a dumb manner <laughs> the spiritual laws, we are just like the dumb cow. We just fall. We just fall. And there is perdition. And salvation, that is the ability to fly in a spiritual world, salvation brings through intelligent obedience to spiritual laws. That is what Christ says in Matthew. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. This is so powerful, so powerful. It's not just, just by faith that salvation comes to man. As, as in his episode, the apostle James says, faith without works is worth nothing. We have to do God's will, and that is obedience, intelligent obedience to spiritual laws. And through this intelligent obedience, then we have the freedom of salvation. That basically is happiness in individual, and in collective life. God says, do not kill, and man kills. God says, do not wish what belongs to others, and man wish and envy and kill for it. So all disobedience to spiritual laws bring disaster. All dumb obedience 
to spiritual law brings disaster. That's why Christ says that salvation just comes to those who do the will of God and not to those who just have faith. We have to have faith and obedience. In a very touching moment, Christ laments the rejection of prophets when he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathered his brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It's so important. When a prophet comes from God and says that I come from God, we have to welcome him. And then we have to analyze if he is really a true prophet or a false prophet. And the three guidances that the Bible gives us are sufficient for that certitude. So if a man says that what he brings is from God, like Christ said, for I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. So Christ tells he is not a philosopher. He is just the messenger of God. He is the word of God amongst men. The same thing is said by all the other prophets, by the, all the other true prophets, and also by the other false prophets. False prophets make the same claim, that they are bringing a message from God. That's why we have to dis distinguish between false and true. <laughs> Baha'u'llah, I just mentioned Baha'u'llah together with Christ. I could have mentioned all the other world prophets. But Baha'u'llah writes, the breezes of the old glorious were wafted over me and taught me the knowledge of all that hath been. This thing is not from me, but from one who is almighty and all-knowing. Okay, so if a man says that he comes from God and that his message is from God, there are just three possibilities. Either he is a liar, or he is a madman, or he is true. There are only these three possibilities. Well, there are false prophets, and they say also that they bring a message from God. How can we distinguish a, a false prophet from a true one? Well, first a liar just says a lie like that to gain advantages. He wants power, he wants wealth, he wants influence. A liar who says that has a message from God, does not go to the cross for that lie. He does not go to, to prison for 40 years like Baha'u'llah and for exile and torture and poisoning like Baha'u'llah suffered because of the lie. No, the first thing that a liar says is, no, no, I was mistaken. It's not really for God from God. It's something that I thought could be useful, you see. And then he escapes cross and he escapes prison. Well, but a madman could go to the cross because of his madness. <laughs> a madman could accept 40 years of imprisonment and torture for his madness. But the most cursory, the most superficial analysis of the life and words of Christ and of Baha'u'llah, and for that matter, of all the other prophets, Buddha, Muhammad, Moses, Zoroaster, the most superficial analysis of their lives and words assures us they are absolutely sane. In reality, 
they have the deepest sanity. They absolutely sane in what they say and how they live. Their truth. So if they are not liars and madmen, they can only be what they say they are. True prophets from God. And then through intelligent obedience to what they reveal, we may be happy. So this is the whole subject. Universal laws in the physical world, universal laws in the spiritual world, discovered in nature, revealed in the spirituality. All of them invisible, immutable, and inescapable. We must obey them, but we may obey them in a dumb manner or an intelligent one. And that makes all the difference. <laughs> I think that was the last one. Yes. <laughs> so thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank you so much for that really interesting presentation. So yeah, people can put their questions in the chat now. The first question is, the same way that humanity has been testing the physical laws and learned how to expand or learn more about its use, is it possible to test spiritual laws to either expand on them or learn more about their positive or negative effects? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. We may. We may test them. And, and in reality, we test them all the time. Uh, every time we, we are dumb <laughs> about, we are fools about the spiritual law, we suffer the consequences. We treat some harshly. We treat, treat, treat someone in an unpolite manner. And then we we find out that we have an enemy <laughs> right away. <laughs> so the law is right there. <laughs> we, we don't forgive someone and we hold grunge against someone and we suffer a lot because not being able to forgive makes us carry a great weight and we suffer for that. So yes, we can taste all the time. And in general, as St. Paul says, although the physical man goes from day to day to its destruction, the spiritual man every day revives. That's why generally people with white hair are more spiritual and wise than people with brown or black hair. Oh, I am not talking about dyeing the hair, of course. I'm talking about the course of nature, yeah? But old age tends to bring wisdom because we test all the spiritual laws all the time. But as an old saying from China, there was a time when old things came from China. Nowadays, just new things from, from, come from China. But there was a time when old things came from China. An old saying said that, says that, the dumb person does not learn anything from what happens. The intelligent person learns from what happens to other people. And the wise person learns from what happens to everyone. So yes, we can learn through experience, but there is a shorter way. <laughs> of course, you can start studying the laws of gravity and all the laws of nature. You can start studying them from scratch. But if you refer to Newton <laughs> and to Ptolemyo and, 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 and to all the wise men of the past and to Einstein, you may learn quicker. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Go to the prophets and you learn in a, in a much more uh, efficient and faster way. <laughs> um, do you think we have to have an understanding of the importance of the laws or is it okay if we just blindly follow certain spiritual laws without knowing why they're useful? Uh -huh. Very interesting question. Very nice. Cute, cute question. <laughs> you see, if we understand why things are done, we may apply the principle to other instances. 
If you just understand what happens in one occasion, it's okay. You may follow that in a, in a daily basis. It's, it's not, not a problem. But if you understand the principle behind what happens, now, then you broaden your understanding. And then your understanding is able to be applied to many other instances. So of course, it's possible to move on once you just blindly follow obediently, intelligently the spiritual laws. But once you understand how they operate and how they function, uh, it brings a whole new universe of possibilities. Um, so you showed a lot of the similar spiritual laws across the different prophets. So then what is the need to have all these different prophets and religions if they're all saying the same thing? Well, Raymond, if these questions are being asked by the chat or you're inventing them right now? Because these were my questions, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Thank you. <laughs> you see, <clears throat> uh, new realities bring new necessities. This is one aspect of life. Yeah. Uh, when in the 19th century, people started to need to move faster and they invented the trains, the first trains, they had to understand the laws of heating coal and of heating and boiling water to utilize the power of steam, okay? But nowadays, no one would like to cross the ocean in an airplane moved by steam. So new realities bring new necessities. We need in our days, the understanding of new laws, physical and spiritual, because reality has changed. We live now in a world that is united by technology, by economic relations, a world that interdependent. So you, we need new spiritual laws. The love of the country is not enough anymore. We have to lo love mankind because love for one's country may mean the hate for another country. And we are witnessing this in our days, sadly, again. So we need an amplification of intelligent obedience to physical laws if we are to move forward physically. And we need intelligent obedience to new spiritual laws if we are to move intelligently in the spiritual world. Um, so human beings have become more intelligent over time. So wh why is it that we can't just come and agree on a set of laws that brings these same ethics, but don't come from a prophet or some other source? Well, first of all, um, we have always, always been intelligent like we are now for the last 200,000 years. Human beings are homo sapiens, at least for the last 200,000 years. If we brought, if we bring, if we were able to bring a child from 200,000 years ago, that is in prehistory, and yeah? we know that history just applies to the last 5,000 years of, of our living together on Earth. If we bring a prehistoric child to our days, and bring that child to our schools, that, that child would learn as much or not learn, depending on the school, <laughs> as a child that is born in our days. Because, because we were just as, as intelligent at that time as we are now. So we, we have not become more intelligent. We have become more aware. We have become more aware of how the world works. We have become more aware how the physical world works and we have become more aware of how the spiritual world works. In the past, it was enough to follow one prophet because the continents were separated. Lives were isolated. One 
one country, one nation, one people, just had heard about another country, another nation, <laughs> another people. Nowadays, we are mingled together. So new realities bring new necessities. Nowadays, it's the time to recognize that all the prophets have come from the same one true God. And that is not an intellectual understanding. When we accept in our hearts, in our heart of hearts, that all the prophets like Buddha, like Muhammad, like Moses, like Christ, like Baha'u'llah, like Zoroaster, and many others whose names history has for, forgotten. If we accept in our hearts that they all bring the word of God, that makes us brothers and sisters of all the other human beings on earth. It's a very deep realization. It's a very deep understanding. And it changes the way we relate to them, the, the, the way we treat them, the way we accept them. I think that's all of our questions. Um, so thank you so much, Mr. Boyce, for this presentation. Um, it was very interesting and we appreciated it so much. <clears throat> very much. Thank you very much, Pamane. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope it serves everybody in their thoughts and <clears throat> in their struggles to be better people and better communities. Thank you. So our speaker next week will be Dr. Dwight Bashir, and he'll be talking about why freedom of religion and belief is inevitable. So again, these are every Saturday at noon Eastern time, and I'll put the link to our YouTube channel and our contact form in the chat.
change this world This world Into a rose garden Through the outpourings of A heavenly grace Oh Thou The compassionate Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you, Paimana.